I think we're uh, about there. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to what is the first Magneto um, briefing that we've um, uh, attempted. Um, for those that don't know Magneto, we're a quarterly uh, magazine um, concentrating on the, the best cars, the best events in the global classic car community. Uh, there are copies of the magazine, um, which you're very happy to uh, pick up on your, on your way out. And the front cover is that of Donald Campbell and the story of his uh, life and his uh, world record attempts at both land and water. So we're delighted to have a, a panel this morning to discuss uh, K7, Bluebird, and the uh, from, from the point of view of its initial uh, rise, uh, sorry, its initial world record um, fulfilling attempts, and then its subsequent restoration. And I think when people look at Bluebird, uh, both its sporting and its engineering achievements, it really stands up there with the Flying Scotsman and, and with Concord. Uh, Donald Campbell, a boyhood hero. And uh, we are delighted to have a, uh, a panel here and on Zoom as well to discuss the, the history of uh, K7 and the current situa situation which uh, the boat finds itself in um, with regards to ownership. Uh, so if I take you very quickly through the panel, uh, I think probably it's best if they introduce themselves. But in terms of the chairman for today is Neil Shepard. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to who I am. I've had Donald Campbell since I was eight. Uh, and I wrote a book about Donald Campbell's last record attempt, uh, his tragic record attempt in 67. I wrote that book about 10 years ago. And I've been asked by Jeff just to come here and uh, see if we can make sense of what's going on at the moment with regards to K7. Uh, next, we have uh, Don Wales. Good morning. Uh, yes, Don Wales. Uh, I'm the, the nephew of Donald Campbell. He was also my, my godfather. Um, I am passionate about... Um, his story and looking after the legacy, if you like, with Cousin Gina. Um, I've broken a few records myself, uh, but I actually earn my living as a photographer. And um, yeah, I'm pleased to be here to put our side of the story um, across as well. So thank you. And next we have Jeff Carroll. Hi, yeah, my name is Jeff Carroll. I'm vice chair of the Coniston Institute and Ruskin Museum, a lifelong resident of Coniston. I've fished boated and all kinds of things on Coniston. I've represented the village in many other things. I've never broken any records or written the book yet. <laughs> and uh, Clive Robertson. Uh, morning, Clive Robertson. I'm a solicitor with uh, Healy's A Firm in Hoburn and uh, I've been involved uh, with the issues surrounding what we're discussing today since uh, autumn 2018. Lastly, but certainly by no means, means least, um, dialing in uh, and with two representation in terms of your faces on the on the on the big screen, Bill. Uh, it's <coughs> Bill Smith. Hello there. Yes, um, export diver and underwater explorer. I had the the uh, dubious idea in 1996 to go and try and find the wreck of K7, and uh, I've always described it as a diving trip that got out of hand. Um, and since that time, I've run the project to. Um, restore the boat and bring it back to working condition. Thank you, and uh, I really appreciate the fact that we have such a uh, interested and uh, knowledgeable panel who can take us through um, K7. Yeah, um, I mean, we started looking just because we had some equipment to test. We had some underwater lighting to test, and that's why we, you know, just thought it'd be an interesting thing to. Um, an interesting target. We did a lot of wreck location in the North Sea, but we needed a winter project. And uh, it, it just seemed like a, a, an interesting target to look for. I actually came across all this due to a, a song by Marillion called Out of This World, um, which begins 300 miles an hour on water. I didn't have any real idea, um, apart from some vague memories 
in black and white of what Bluebird was. So we started to go there in the summer of 96. We couldn't find anything, but truth be told, we spent rather more time in the pub than we did on the water, which was all rather nice. But towards the end of 2000, it was starting to rattle us that we couldn't find this target in what was quite a small area. We've heard this, this thing many times about how come it was known where it was, but not disclosed. But the reality was that <clears throat> once some of the local people got interested and, uh, and, and started helping us at Tenor, they didn't know where it was either, not within, you know, kind of a thousand yards, which is a long way in, in, that, in those sort of conditions. So it was the end of October 2000 when we finally located the wreck in 140 feet of water. And we dived it to confirm that. And uh, we brought some video back. And the intention was then was just to, to have a bit of a look and then leave well alone. But by this point, uh, I'd been in contact with Gina, who was obviously very interested in finding her dad. And we pledged to do this, or at least have a good try at it. And we spoke with two different groups of people. We spoke with the Air Accident Investigation Branch in Farnborough, who put us in touch with Steve Moss. Steve was a senior investigator. Um, he was the lead man at Lockerbie, and he knew everything about where debris falls in the event of high-speed impact. And we also spoke with Air Commodore Dr. Tony Cullen of the RAF Pathology Department, um, and he knew all about what became of people who were involved in high-speed accidents and uh, who, that were left in water for some length of time. And that became the new mission. Um, in the process of doing this, we had a, a diver badly injured. Uh, it was his own fault, but he made a full recovery, but it was a bit of a wake-up call. And in the light of that, the request was made to us to just clear the site, get all the wreckage out of there lift it up don't leave a situation where people might be endangered because what had happened because our diver had been in the paper now everybody knew about the bluebird wreck so we didn't intend for any of that to happen uh and gina said look you better clear the place out in case it happens to somebody else so we became the kind of um although the original target had been look but don't touch then it had been look kate donald campbell it be, we, we then ended up with you know a ton and a half of scrap metal um, which at the time, yes, for all it's an iconic vessel, that's that's essentially what we were working with. You know, we had dangerous sharp edges and all, you know, badly corroded material. Um, and, and we lifted everything out and we, we put it into storage, believing somewhat naively that every museum in the land would form a queue to put their hands on this thing. The reality being that nobody wanted to touch this slowly fizzing, damp liability of a thing. Um, and therefore, the next request was, well, can you rebuild it? So we did a, a nine-month feasibility study where we, we spoke with material scientists, aircraft restorers, etc., to see whether it was feasible. And the conclusion was that we caught it just in time. Um, what had saved the material that we had was the magnesium engine. It had acted as a big sacrificial anode deep in the hull. And this had preserved a lot of the material, but it was right on the cusp of being lost. So we got there with minutes to spare. Uh, and we then, um, we spent four years attempting to interest the Heritage Lottery Fund to no avail, um, two attempts. And eventually we just had to, to cut them loose and set the project up to run on its, on its own strengths. And we started the rebuild work in 2005. Well, we actually started the strip down in 2005. The first rivet didn't go in until 2008. And then it was 2000 and, well, it was middle of 2017 when we concluded that we'd shortly be in a position to do a little bit of testing. I mean, we've always said it's a bit like you can restore your car um, and you can get an MOT on it and you can put the driver's seat in and you can take it around the block. That doesn't make it finished. That gets you to the point where you can see if it works. And that's where we got to in 2018. And we went to LockFAD, did some testing. Um, very, very happy with that. Um, unfortunately, since then, we've been uh, in a little bit of a holding pattern. But, the, you know, we're hoping that in the not too distant future, we can pick up the restoration and get it finished. Uh, we'll just have to see on that one. Thank you, Bill. Uh, 
Don, you're going to talk about uh, the Campbell Heritage Family Trust and gifting K7 to the Ruskin Museum following its rise. I think really we, we need to um, go back to 1967, really, and, and not lose sight of the fact that um, a person died um, in that boat, my uncle, Gina's, Gina's dad. And effectively, he was um, lying at the bottom of Coniston somewhere. And um, it should have been sort of respected, if you like, that um, it was like a war grave, if you, if you will. Um, but divers went down shortly after the accident uh, and located the wreck and uh, looked for a few days to try and find um, the remains of, of my uncle, didn't succeed. And it was sort of decided then by the family. I mean, I was only six years old, so I was too young to know exactly what was going on or who my uncle even was at that stage. But my mum, so Donald's sister, and Tonya, Tonya being the, um, except, well, the beneficiary of Donald's estate, um, sort of uphold or upheld the, the belief, which my mum said mostly, that Skipper and Craft should stay together. And as we can't find his body to give him a decent uh, burial, therefore we should leave the boat at the bottom of the lake. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. So. Um, and uh, the cost to the family then of trying to bring the boat or the wreck back to the surface was just too much. Donald had spent all the money and um, there was nothing left. Tonya did incredibly well to not go bankrupt herself um, and you know the family tried to sort of keep together and just do the best they could. So there it laid for many years and um, it's my belief that the coordinates of where the wreck was were in a safe uh, in Lord Mishcon's offices in London. So the, the whereabouts of the boat, if needed, um, were, were, were very obvious and plain. So fast forward um, in time, you know, and the, the legend of Donald Campbell, if you like, sort of grew and grew. The, the locals fiercely protected the fact that, you know, and in that lake there is um, a body and um, a wreck of a boat that um, is, it should stay there. We don't want anyone diving for it. It was always our worry that um, people would want to dive on it and would pick bits off it, and it would become a bit of a, a treasure hunt. Um, you know, didn't have eBay in those days, but uh, bits would possibly appear somewhere and collectors would, would buy it. So um, I believe some divers or a diver had actually found it, and I believe that a marker boy had been put on it. Yeah, there was a dive team went down in the, I believe it was 1980s or very early 90s, 1980s it would have been, and they thought they'd found your uncle because they found a body and then it turned out that it wasn't your uncle. That's right. Yeah. And uh, they'd obviously, uh, and uh, I think you're right, that there were basically, there were items taken from the boat by these dive teams. I think a, a small number had gone down and taken bits off the boat and then yeah. they would suddenly appear for sale or be offered to a, a museum yeah. or whatever. So it, it did happen uh, in the 1980s. And I think, you know, as Bill intimated, that technology was increasing where the yeah. sort of equipment open to dive teams just became more and more readily available. So it kind of seemed that there was inevitability that over time, more dive teams would probably make an attempt to actually yeah. dive on the boat. Absolutely. And that was always, that was always a concern. And um, Bill did uh, tap me on the shoulder in 1997 up at Coniston when it was the 30th anniversary of, of the crash. There's always a little memorial service up there. Um, and and he, he just said, um, hello, I'm, I'm Bill Smith. I'm a diver. I'm going to find your uncle's boat. Uh, and I said to him then, well, I, I wish you wouldn't. 
you know, that, that was my personal position. Um, anyway, he um, carried on and, and found it. And then uh, immediately that the boat came out, or they'll call it the wreck, came out of Coniston, we had um, another character make a ownership claim of the wreck. He said he owned that wreck because he had bought from the insurance company um, the wreck because the insurance company had paid out for it, which is not quite true. Uh, but he built this um, plausible but totally, totally false story that he had paid a pound for the wreck. Um, and therefore, it didn't belong to the Campbell family. So we had to fight that claim initially to prove that the wreck belonged to the estate of Donald Campbell and therefore um, Tonya being the, the beneficiary of that. So that took a few um, months uh, and a bit of money and uh, it was proven that the boat belonged to the Campbell family, the wreck belonged to the Campbell family. And Tonya uh, living in America, she said that she really didn't want um, she didn't want the boat raised in the first place, the wreck. Um, my mum didn't either. And I managed to convince them that, well, it's come up. We, as a family, need to do something about it. Because um, had we left it there, it will come up in some time, maybe 10, 20 years' time, or it will come up in bits. And whilst we've got close enough relatives, Gina as well as um, the nephews, um, to do something about it. Uh, so Tonya said, well, um, what can we do about it? She said she, she didn't want it. And she said she would like me to have it. And I said to her, I said, well, that's very kind of you and very generous. But that iconic boat, if we get it restored or even as it, as it is now, it's far too important to be in the control of one person. No one person should have control over it. So I said, well, would you, rather than donate it to me, donate it to the Campbell Heritage Trust, which is it's a family trust. It's not a charitable status or anything. It's just a family private trust run by then by my mum, uh, Gina, and my two brothers, so the five of us. So Tonya said, yes, fine, um, I will donate it with some conditions to the family trust. And um, you can do with it as you wish. So it's now presented to the, to the, back to the family, if you like, and um, we don't know quite what to do with it. And the idea of putting it on display as a wreck, because we went to Bill's um, engineering works and he had it all laid out, and it was very ghoulish and gruesome. There was no way you could put that on display. Uh, but Tonya said, well, actually, maybe put it on display as a wreck. You know, that's what happened, and, but we disagreed. So uh, looking around to see what we could do, the best option was obviously to try and get it restored. And uh, we asked Bill to, to help with that. And we asked, you know, where are we going to get the money from? And we applied, as Bill said earlier on, to uh, the uh, Heritage Lottery and they declined us twice. Uh, and Bill volunteered to say, well, I can do it. I will take charge and uh, I will do it completely free of charge and um, I want to do it. it. No matter how long it takes, I will do it and I will find out people to, who will help um, and then it will go on display in the museum. So um, that's how we sort of left it. That's how we, we thought, great, that's, we'll trust you to do that. Um, but we will present it to the Ruskin Museum at some stage uh, because Skipper and Craft, as far as we were concerned, should always stay together. Bill had found Donald's body um, and Gina gave him a good Christian burial at Coniston, so therefore get the boat back to Coniston. Uh, I firmly believed that, well, if it goes to Coniston, uh, it should just go on display. You don't want to have um, another accident with it or put people in danger. And um, that's pretty much where, where we sort of got to and 
we um, told the museum, this is coming to you guys at some point. So, um, you know, be ready for it. And uh, Bill's going to restore it for you. It turned out then that the museum, which I'm sure Jeff will allude to, didn't have room for it. So they had to apply for grants to, to build a, a big wing to house the boat. But they couldn't do that without ownership of the wreck uh, or the restored boat. So uh, Gina had a, a, a document drawn up, which I think Bill um, was involved with. Well, I know Bill was involved with. And this document was quickly put together and the uh, boat was handed over to the museum, the wreck, to um, be restored by Bill and put on display. And we were, I was sort of involved a little bit at that stage, excuse me, trying to um, not influence, but just to sort of say, I don't think we should run this boat. <clears throat> and at that time, Gina agreed. Um, but slowly, as, as Bill got to work on it, uh, I sort of mellowed, if you like, in that respect, and thinking, well, because he was saying, well, if we're going to build it back to January the 4th specification, it may as well run. Uh, well, it may as well fire the engine up. Um, well, if we're going to fire the engine up, then why don't we um, actually put it on the water? And then if we've got it on the water, we may as well run it. And if we've got it, we may as well get it up on the plane. And if we've got it up on the plane, we may as well do 100 miles an hour. So it, the goalposts have always moved, which is always my worry that it would get faster and faster and faster um, and something terrible could happen. Um, and uh, that's pretty much where, where we ended up, was Bill took control, um, been given the trust to, to do that and to end up presenting the boat back to um, Constance to be put on display. And um, we now, um, obviously have the, the situation that I'm sure will be um, talked about in a minute, that um, 20 years later, we don't have the boat on public display and we are all very keen and willing for it to run again um, on Coniston, maybe somewhere else. Uh, I have absolutely no desire to drive it myself, despite what certain people say about that. I have no desire to own it. Uh, I have owned it once and I have given it away to the museum. So anything else that is said about that is, is not true. Um, and um, here we are discussing it today, and I'm happy to discuss about it. But there's an awful lot more behind that, I think, that will become clear soon. So, well, Thank you, John. I, I think it's worth saying that in the dealings with the National Heritage Lottery Fund, they were very keen that the boat shouldn't be restored and that it should be displayed as a grotesque monument to what had happened, which I find utterly and totally grotesque. Yes, that was. Uh, and that was ultimately what caused the split with the National Heritage Lottery Fund, because they weren't willing to deviate from that. So That's one of the reasons, I believe. Uh, yeah. The Ruskin Museum obviously showed you know, enormous interest in basically wanting to celebrate and preserve the legacy of Donald Campbell in Coniston. And so as you alluded to, Don, a wing was built to house Bluebird, and perhaps, uh, Jeff, you could go through the Ruskin Museum's involvement. Yeah, um, the, I think the Ruskin Museum was interested in, in being involved in the story of Bluebird more than it already had been, because it, it already had a display about uh, Campbell and Bluebird, but um, early, not long after the, uh, the boat was brought up, I know that Vicky Slow was in contact with Bill stating an interest that the, the museum would like to be involved. And I'll try to, to, to carry on with this, but not tread on too much of what Don said, really, because a lot of it was concurrent. And the original Bluebird project was the Campbell Family Heritage Trust, the Ruskin Museum and Bill all working together to try and get the boat restored with the Heritage Lottery Fund. So the, the Bluebird project, as it was, was a tripartite operation. And by the time it got to 2006, um, obviously the HLF uh, situation had progressed to where it had got to, and then it would, the boat was gifted to the museum. Now, at that point, the, uh, 
they all went off and did the separate things. Now, as Neil said, the museum needed to build a wing. Now, in 2004, we'd already explored that. And as part of getting planning permission, obviously, Coniston's in a national park. So as part of getting planning permission, we had to do a unilateral undertaking that the boat would be in there for 25 years after it went in and be absent for it, from it for no more than 28 days. So that's one of the little wrinkles that's in, uh, in the timeline. So when we move on from there, the first, uh, the first donation was a £250,000 donation from the Cumbria Vision, which was uh, the last dregs of the money from the foot and mouth disease recovery fund. Uh, I don't know if you can remember that far back, but that was 2001 was foot and mouth. And that was a really big uh, seed fund and it allowed us to, to go to other people and get other grants. But a lot of the money was raised just by personal donation and business donation. Now, in some ways, Bill got the, uh, the plumb bit of the project, really, because it's a lot sexier thing to rebuild an iconic hydroplane than it is to build a building. And a lot of it gets overlooked. But the final uh, cost of the building was three quarters of a million pounds. Now, if you think that that was done from 2006, the, the financial crash was in 2007. So all the money, you know, everybody was tight on money. It, there wasn't a lot of, uh, a lot of benefic uh, benefit going around. So really, you know, the museum punched well above its weight. I mean, Coniston's only a, a village of about 800 people. Uh, some people find it hard to find. I don't because I've lived there all my life. But, um, you know, some people find it quite off the beaten track. Obviously, the Campbell family didn't because even some Malcolm had used it as, uh, as his record-breaking venue. And, in fact, this morning, they're doing the record. It's this first day of the records week, first day they can run, and the people up there at Coniston now breaking records. So the museum was involved at a very early stage. It did, the, uh, it did what it was asked to do. The first sods were turned in 2008, and the museum's been open and ready. The Bluebird Wing has been available for that boat to go in since 2010. Now, in 2015, uh, one of the operations team from the Bluebird Project Limited came to the, uh, to the parish council and said, we're getting the boat to a position where we can start thinking about a return event. Now, from early 2016 till early 2019, a Bluebird event working group was, had, had been formed. I was on it. And all the time, the, the difficulty was, how do you organize an event when you don't know when you're going to get the star attraction? Because you're always trying to nail a jelly to the wall. What date are you going to get this? What date can you do it? Because if you ring somebody up and say, would you like to bring your burger van to Coniston? Because there's going to be 10,000 people turn up. And they're all going to want burgers. They say, yeah, great. When? And you go, well, we're not really sure yet. So in early 2018, uh, we were told, or the museum was told, that uh, they were going to be going, the boat was going to be going to Loch Fad for crew training, which we were told would be really mainly launch recovery, start procedures, etc. We weren't really aware or informed, as far as I'm aware anyway, that the boat was intended to run in the way it was run. So, you know, we, we ended up as a, in some respects, a hostage to fortune. But we roll on from there, and then in late 2018, we uh, get to learn that, that Bill is now asserting, or the Bluebird Project is now asserting, uh, some form of ownership rights upon the boat, which, although I understand they've been talked about, I've only been a trustee of the museum since 2018, but I understand they've been talked about and discussed at some level previously. It had never really come to the fore. And that, to some extent, is uh, the reason why we're out, the position where we're at. Thanks, Jeff. So I think with regards to your comments about the running at FAD, Bill will correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think there's an expectation that it would be a crew training exercise because they were there for two weeks and there was no guarantee that they would ever get that boat anywhere near 
cleaning. And I was there to witness, I, I went there on the Saturday and I was there to witness along with Gina. Uh, and the boat was launched on the Saturday. It floated and it stayed floating. And then it was taken off the lake and it had shipped to small water. And then on the Sunday, the boat was launched again. It was to run the engine. Excuse me. That's not mine. Uh, and then uh, a pilot had been nominated to drive Bluebird. Two pilots had been nominated to drive Bluebird with Gina's blessing. And the boat was run on the Sunday and effectively it planed more or less. It was a low speed run, but it planed and there was very large crowds there. And it was decided on the Monday to see if we could actually get it to physically plane. And uh, in late in the day on the Monday, with good weather conditions, it was made to physically plane and it traveled at about 100 miles an hour. So I don't think necessarily there was a, any malice of forethought in terms of achieving what was achieved. I think it just happenstance and good fortune that ultimately it was it performed as it was designed to perform, if you like. Perhaps you can take us through some of the legal questions that have arisen since LOCFAD with regard to Bluebird K7 and where we are at the moment. I will try. <laughs> as you can probably imagine, there's a huge mass of paperwork relating to Bluebird, its history, its legal history, and where have we got to now. And, I mean, we could, we could have the rest of the day here and still not get to it. So what I've tried to do is keep it to uh, four very simple uh, events or points or dates when I, I think the shape that we're in now uh, uh, appeared, if you like, if I can put it that way. I'm slightly going back on what some of, uh, of the rest of the panel have referred to. And I think I'd like to start with the deed of gift, which is in December 2006. And this is where the Heritage Trust gave the boat to the Ruskin Museum. And it was quite a simple document. And I think it might help if I actually read it. I'm sorry, it's not too legalish, it's not too dull, but bear with me. So it said that the Ruskin Museum agrees that upon taking unencumbered ownership of the property, Bluebird K7, it will be conserved and reconfigured to be of operable condition as close as reasonably possible to such condition as it was at 8.30 on the 4th of January 1967. Very straightforward. The conservation and reconfiguration of the Bluebird to the standard or appearance as it was then will be carried out under the control of Mr. Bill Smith. And finally, Clause 5 goes on to say that uh, the Ruskin Museum warrants that the following, following completion of the conservation and reconfiguration of Bluebird, whenever that may be, the Ruskin Museum will place the property, K7, on permanent display within the Ruskin Museum for educational purposes for public benefit. So, really, very simple, very fairly straightforward requirement. Now, over time, events carried on, the boat was worked on, it made progress. Um, in, how am I? Right, okay, sorry. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so, carrying on to 2013, uh, there was a flurry of exchanges between Bill Smith and Don Wales, and one of them took a particular turn when Bill Smith said that um, the Ruskin Museum owned the salvaged wreck and the parts to be salvaged, but that the BP project owned the components sourced or to be created to bring the machine back to completeness. Now, this is the first, uh, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, understanding on the part of, uh, of anybody 
uh, that uh, the BPP owns part of the boat. Now, this was not accepted uh, by uh, the Ruskin Museum. There were debates about uh, an agreement trying to be put together because that obviously made sense to have an agreement at this point, but nothing was concluded. Matters rumbled on again, and uh, time goes by. The boat was worked on. It's not everybody's uh, daily work until uh, Loch Fad trials came upon uh, the museum, and once again, the ownership issue came up, naturally. Um, a without prejudice meeting was proposed by uh, the Heritage Trust, and I think that was Don Wales who suggested that. Um, meeting took place, unfortunately there were no lawyers there, um, which meant that the parties, apart from the lawyers being there and putting a bill in, it meant that the parties had to discuss it themselves uh, in, the, in their own manner. However, at that meeting, Bill Smith said uh, that a precursor to any arrangements being put in place was that the Ruskin Museum had to accept uh, that they were part owners, that is, the project, were part owners of the boat. Now, the fact of the matter is, the way the trust was set up, the museum didn't have the ability to, even if they wanted to, to part with part ownership of something they had been gifted as a, a total object. So I'm, I sort of mentioned that in passing. So we come to 2021 when, after much debate about how this could be settled, uh, Bill Smith effectively said, and harking back to 2013, we say again that the museum owns the parts that were taken up as the wreckage, but that we also say again, we own the parts that we put to the boat and we uh, the parts that made it come together and run. And that being the case, why don't we dismantle it and then the museum can have the parts they own and uh, the uh, BBS will go off and do whatever they need to do, whatever that may be. Now, that wasn't an appealing prospect, and I think everybody understands it's not a great prospect, but the museum felt it had to consider this because there had to be some conclusion. They have a duty to have the boat, as I started my reading in 2006. They have a duty to have the boat repaired and put in the museum. Now, it had proved to have been running in 2018, and it still hadn't come back to the museum, but they thought they had a duty to consider going along with this proposal, unattractive though it may see, seem. Now, they put in a reasonable amount of time in talking to experts on aircraft construction, because essentially the boat is an aircraft construction and not a waterborne product. And so they talked to experts in the field about the prospect of dismantling, how it would be done, I had to read a lot of paperwork on, on rivets and how to take them out and um, stresses in um, airframes effectively to understand what was being debated. And they spent a lot of time looking into this and wondering how it could be delivered in a safe way, supervised, and so on and so forth. Now, while the museum was considering its position on this and it said, yes, we'd look at it, um, Bill Smith on the 15th of October uh, sent an email to the museum saying that um, he had looked at the court of a public opinion in terms of um, social media and so forth, and it seemed that uh, the court of a public opinion says they don't want the boat to be dismantled, and and that the, they want public opinion, the public want to see the boat running and being displayed. So. The short answer to that is that the museum have duties under the terms of the trust deed and they are not there to respond to the public, although ultimately they have to do that because the boat needs to be in the museum so that the public can see it. Now, 
the museum is now presently considering its position and has not formally replied to that email. And that is where we are. Yeah. So I think the perspective, and I'll bring my perspective in now, I think we're all reasonable men. And I think we all have the same goal. And I don't think any one party to this unfortunate series of events should leave, lose track of the wider picture, which is the fact that we now have a patent Bluebird K7 that 20 years ago was on the bottom of Lake Coniston. Coniston Water. Water. Apologise. Indeed, yes. Pass and wait. So, from my perspective, there's only one of two ways that this appears that it can go. Either Bluebird K7, as it exists at the moment, is dismantled, and some parts are delivered to the Ruskin Museum. And the Ruskin Museum, I believe, have in place a solution to rebuild Bluebird K7 in a period of time. Two to three years, I believe, we've said, Jeff. And Bill Smith and the Bluebird Project are free to use the parts that they have sourced and built in the last 15 years to build a replica. So we'll end up with two, K two crafts that look like Bluebird K7. One will be a replica made of new parts, and one will be effectively what we have at the moment, although it isn't clear to me what expertise exists away from the Bluebird project. I'm not casting aspersions here. I'm just saying it as I see it. I don't think anyone should underestimate what the Bluebird project has achieved. So that's one route we can go down. Or the other route we can go down is that we have some form of agreement here between reasonable men that involves those reasonable people sitting in a room and realising that no one party is evil and no one party you know, is a bunch of angels. We're all human, we make mistakes, we say things which we later perhaps wish we hadn't said. And in a spirit of compromise, that group of people get together and say, what's past is past. We have in our hands the ability to deliver in a short space of time, Bluebird K7 sitting in the Ruskin Museum. And in 30 or 40 years time, all the people on this audience will have shuffled off this mortal coil. But Bluebird K7 will still exist. So Bluebird K7 needs to be put in place now, a legacy to, uh, you know, a, a, a solution to preserve its legacy forever. In the same way that nobody that, you know, was around, uh, you, you know, it was responsible for the production of the Mallard steam, steam locomotive or the Flying Scotsman or, you know, the first motor cars or whatever. They're not around anymore, but those items are still preserved and they're preserved for the nation. And so what I would like to say is that I think there's been fault on all sides. I think there have been miscommunications. I think there have been instances, particularly in the last few years, where social media has taken over people's you know, sensible thoughts that they'll uh, you know, discuss privately and it's become a very much he said, she said uh, state of affairs where you have the Campbell Family Heritage Trust, Ruskin Museum camp over here, and then the Bluebird Project camp over here. And both sides appear in terms of social media and social media's cheerleaders to effectively you know, think that one side's with the angels and the other side is you know, the devil incarnate. And it's not that. We have here an opportunity which I don't think any enthusiast of the life and works of Donald Campbell ever believed was possible 20 years ago. 
I got interested in Donald Campbell and Bluebird when I was age eight because my parents told me about the fact that they had witnessed him break his first record in 1955. I never in my wildest dreams as an eight-year-old believed that I would actually get to see Bluebird K7 and be kind of part of its legacy, if you like. I never dreamed that that would be a possibility. And it is. And I think, as you've all three alluded to, the goalposts have moved since one almost because the goalposts were bound to move since 2001, because nobody knew in 2020, nobody knew the Campbell legacy would continue to grow. I remember vividly going to Coniston as a small child. in the Rusty Museum. No, various of the pubs in Coniston are uh, adorned, their walls are adorned. I do not. And I And I finally found my last Donald Campbell book in 1990. The internet has allowed anybody who wants to complete a collection of Donald Campbell books to do it in about half an hour. You can do it now. And that's what the internet has brought us. And it just so happens to coincide with the timeline of Bluebird K7. And I guarantee that if Bill Smith had not recovered Bluebird K7, my book would never have been written. The photographs in my book would never have been witnessed by the 7,000, 8,000 people who bought that book. The various TV documentaries that have been made would never have been made. The various other books written by David Tremaine, Falter, other people have never been written. Most few die-hard enthusiasts and Campbell family, and I don't mean this in any very disparaging because I don't think I could be accused of being in any way disparaging about Donald Campbell, but I think his memory would have slowly faded. Bluebird 7. New Zealand. Bluebird CN7. And they've owned Bluebird CN7 since the 19, late 1970s of the early 80s. And they haven't got any money, so they can't restore it. They can't look after it properly, so it's slowly, slowly deteriorating. And it gets hawked around from place to place occasionally, and it's done without any real care. So I've seen pictures of Bluebird CN7 when it was put in that museum in 1972, and it is immaculate, because Leo Villa, in one of the last things he did for his old employer, spent time restoring it after its accident at Debden in 1966. And every year since, Bluebird CN7 has more dents in it, more paint chipped off it. I went to the Goodwood Festival Speed when Bluebird CN7 was exhibited there in 2013. And they put it in a sand pit. And of course, it was nice sunny summer weather. The wind blew up and blew sand onto the body of Bluebird CN7. So the museum had actually employed someone to go around with a duster, dusting across the bodywork of this car covered in sand, covering it in more scratches. And my dream in all of this is that reasonable men get together and think, God, we've got something wonderful here. Let's get together and figure out what we need to do to deliver for all of us, for all the people on this stage, for all the people in this audience, and for all the people that expressed an interest in Bluebird, who went to Loch Fad, who'd come to Coniston. And I think that's within the goal of everyone here, because we're reasonable, intelligent men who can decide 
what's past is past. We've said a lot of nasty things about each other and we've cast aspersions and we've alluded to people's, you know, motivations. And we can carry on in the past forever, but it gets us nowhere. Where we need to be is in the here and now and in the future. And this is within the grasp of the people to achieve this. Far, far greater problems in mankind have been solved than this particular problem. And I really do think that we're facing at the situation at the moment, it seems to me pretty stark. Either what we have at the moment gets dismantled or what we have can continue in a spirit of cooperation. Is it working? Is mine working? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The original agreement that was drawn up by Bill's lawyer that Gina signed could be stuck to the boat delivered back in a restored condition and put in the museum. And once it's in the museum, we can start making some decisions about it. But for me, that's the principal thing that has to be fulfilled. We've got to put it in the museum to fulfill the deed of gift from the Campbell family. And we've got to put it in a museum to fulfil the planning permission and to, uh, to fulfil the obligations for the donors who actually made that building possible. And until that's done, I think everything else is just white noise. Fill that, fulfil that deed of gift, and then we can look at it. But until then, I think it's all just white noise. But I don't think it is, Jeff, because I think the intention is if you'll forgive me, that if that were to happen, the Bluebird Project would have no further say in the running of Bluebird K7. Does the and deed of gift give them that? Well, like I said, uh, you know, five minutes ago, I think there's a moving target here. And we've got to face reality, because reality is that... Bill Smith has put 20 years of his life into this. And for that, for what you want to happen, and you're basically saying the Bluebird Project are really going to be shuffled off to the sidelines, that's what you appear to be saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is fulfil the deed of gift because that, that was the ben, original but, but, instruction. But then are the Bluebird Project still involved in the ongoing maintenance and running of... K7. We're not saying they're not involved, but we're not saying they are. So that's a stumbling <laughs> point. Well, perhaps. But, 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 but see, see what I mean? Because ultimately, you've got a, a point there where two parties are of the opinion we can't move past that. Because Bill's going to think, if I deliver the boat to the museum... Actually, Bill, you, 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 I don't want to put words in your mouth. I want to hear from you, and I want to hear... Do you want to make an agreement? Do you want to be part of a compromise that needs to happen here? We've said for a very long time that we want to have an agreement and we want to be part of a compromise. If I could just go back over some things that were said earlier. When we first got involved with the restoration, we were told you must do it such that it costs us nothing. Now, Jeff, this was before your time. Um, and we said yes, but you know what that will end up with? it will end up with us having to go this completely alone and we'll end up as joint owners. And it, what came back was, yeah, that's fine as long as you do the heavy lifting. Now, if you read the Ruskin Museum's Wikipedia page, and I'm just going to read a sentence of it to you. This has been here for God knows how long. And it reads, the original recovered material is now the property of the museum, while the restored and replaced parts of the boat remain under the control of the Bluebird Project, who retain ownership of their materials. Now, that's been there for 10 years that I know of, and nobody's thought to move it. So this, as you said, is a moving target. Now, we decided in 2013 that we'd try and set this on a more formal basis, because essentially what happened in 2013 was we were able to say with certainty that we had a reliable power plant for the boat. Up to that point, we didn't know what we could do with regard to um, propulsion and, uh, and jet engines. And around then we got involved with aerospace at a very high level. And we were able to, to put in place proper, reliable um, 
power plants for the boat. And we reached agreement with the museum, not with Vic Eastlow, but in a, a process of offer, counter offer and acceptance with a clear intention to agree, um, involving Anne Hall, who was the chair then and who still is, and Nick Monk, who's still the treasurer. And whatever form that agreement took, the fact of the matter is that agreement was reached. Now, the agreement was that the Bluebird project would operate and maintain Bluebird going forward. How that affected any other agreements in the background, uh, um, with the greatest of respect, wasn't our problem to solve, but that is what was agreed. Now, we acted in reliance on that for many years after that. Uh, we actually spoke to the Bluebird Event Working Group in 2017, middle of 2017, to say that in a year's time we could be on the water for, for some testing and some trials. Uh, and they declined our offer and, and sent us off up to Log Fad, which, as you know, was a, a really great success. And then in 2019, as, as was mentioned there briefly, there was a without prejudice meeting that took place in Coniston, uh, at which time a further agreement was reached because this, is, this evolves as time goes on. Um, what the 13 agreement didn't give was a, a time frame or a time limit for when we would operate. The 2019 agreement went a step further uh, and it needed a little bit of tweakery because by this point, the bylaw amendment that we started applying for in 2008, I think, that had been superseded. The 19 agreement basically the Bluebird project to fully maintain, complete the anti deterioration measures, which, as has been pointed out, we're dealing with a lot of aircraft stuff and you have to stay on top of it even when it's not moving, as with CN7 and also to be able to operate Bluebird on water. And that was agreed at the meeting in 2019. Sadly, when the first written draft of that appeared for us to look at, it was peppered with um, clauses, not unlike, we're not saying they will and we're not saying they won't, but things that were just unworkable, that sort of thing. Um, and we said, well, listen, it's present form doesn't work. And uh, our, man Peter Roper Hall who spent his whole life as head of PR for Jaguar Land Rover Peter then attempted to progress this agreement further uh, and for one reason or another he failed but Bluebird Project has been committed for many years going way you know beyond 2013 into the past to have an agreement and a compromise such that Bluebird spends most of the year because bear in mind we can't run the thing endlessly you know um, most of the year on display and a proportion of the year in maintenance and in operation to make sure that what we've done over the past 15 years is kept absolutely tip top. Now, that surely is a win-win situation for everybody. Nobody can lose from that because we keep Bluebird in fighting condition and in the public eye. And then when we all go home after having done that for a few months, the museum has the benefit of it the rest of the time. Nobody can lose. So obviously, we're more than keen to enter into an agreement of that sort of thing. It's happened twice. It's fallen apart twice. There's no reason why on the third attempt it shouldn't stick. And I mean, our intention was after Lock Fad in 2018, we were given dates by the Park Authority. We worked long and hard to get the Park Authority on side. And they finally granted us dates of the 19th to the 29th of July, 2019 which gave us 12 months to finish the restoration, which I stress is not finished. Um, and we would then have come off the water in July, 2019, and the boat would have gone in the museum then. Only, you know, the, the agreements that we made have, have not been, um, they've not been honored, so to speak. So we were in a position a few years ago and willing a few years ago, to put the boat in the museum and we've not been able what we're not going to do i mean you have to remember that you have a team of people who've given their lives to this i've done it 25 years the newest members have done it five years all the ones in between are anywhere between 20 and 15 years of effort and that's without all the stakeholders the companies that have supported us the enthusiasts who've supported us the sponsors and what our concern is that we're basically being told right shuffle it through the door you know, this age old, long superseded deed of gift that Bluebird Project were never signatories to or bound by anyway is held up and, you know, regularly and said, oh, this is the be all and end all. When the world has moved on a long way in 20 years, 
And what we're not prepared to risk is being told, right, give us that. You all go home. And uh, if we're of a mind to at some point in the future, we'll, we'll call you up because that's, a, you know, after people have poured heart and soul and their company's resources and everything else into this, um, that's not an option. And also, it's a crazy option to put that machine at risk of not being properly maintained. And the Bluebird project are without question the best qualified people to maintain it. So just to let it stand for longer than is necessary would be irresponsible in itself. So an agreement must be reached. An agreement can be a compromise that suits everybody. Everybody wins. And we've said for the longest time, let's get it done. And that's what we're setting here now, waiting for it to be done. Tom, do you want to... Um, yeah, is that working or do you want to... Uh... Yeah, it's working. Um, I've listened a lot to what's being said, and occasionally I've had to bite my lip. Um, I don't know where to start without getting too um, controversial, but your point, um, Neil, about reasonable people, um, yes, if everyone was reasonable, there would be no doubt we would reach an agreement. Um, one of the things that sticks in my mind is after the meeting of 2019, uh, we thought we had reasonable people around the table and we had come up with a reasonable agreement and that everyone was going to draw a line in the sand and move forward, as you've said. And this is not the first time, or well, wasn't the first time, hasn't been the first time that that has been suggested. And uh, I, for one, said to Bill, fine, because he rang me. Line in the sand, apology accepted for all the nastiness that you have um, posted um, on social media about me. I have never on social media said anything nasty about you. So reasonable people would take that on trust that that will never happen again. And that we had the makings of an agreement that um, the Ruskin were going to have the vote for nine months, Bill was going to have it for three months. <clears throat> Personally, I thought that was a, a big win for, for Bill's team, um, but that's what we agreed. Um, and then the wheels came off that, and lo and behold, I'm being slagged off on social media again. Reasonable people, reasonable people wouldn't do that. Um, and the nastiness has made the gulf between us bigger. And I think that the trenches have been dug so deep that it's very difficult to get across them. I have always said that the boat shouldn't be owned or have the control of one person. At the moment, that's what we have. We have the control. It's not coming out of, out of the workshop until we have an agreement. Um, if somebody is instructed or volunteers to restore anything and they get public people donations, public time, helping that, whether it takes six weeks, two minutes, five years, um, it doesn't give them any ownership claim on it, no matter how much um, effort they've put in. Um, I have said many times that I think that what they have done is superb, I'm not taking anything away from that restoration and what the, the team have done. Um, I even got told off for saying that once. Um, so um, you cannot make an ownership claim on restoring a property. No matter what you've put on it, I'm sure the businesses and um, the, the, the volunteers who have helped were doing it for the greater good, not for the Bluebird Project to make an ownership claim and then hold ransom that they must be in control of doing this and that over the museum. Um, I think it's unreasonable. And if you're talking about reasonable people, yes, had this been done properly, as agreed, Mr. Smith and the Bluebird Project would be running that boat um, on Coniston and with agreement anywhere else, that I am sure. Um, but we've got to the stage now where surely enough is enough. Um, I don't see um, a way around that personally because of the, the characters involved. I'm one of the characters, but I have not been uh, bullying anyone I feel I've been bullied. At one point, I couldn't show my face in Coniston, purely because of the stories 
coming from Newcastle, that I wanted to own the boat, that I wanted to drive it, and I wanted to take it on a world tour. The complete fabrication. At one point, I owned it anyway. Another point, Bill asked me, would I consider driving it? He said he could tra train me up and I would be the ideal person to drive it. I declined because I didn't approve. I didn't think it was right. Um, as I said, I've mellowed. I'm quite happy for, in, in my opinion, for it to be on display and to see it run. I mean, the, the racer in me would love to see it on Coniston and hear it and see it in its um, magnificence. It's an iconic machine. Um, however, we must remember that someone died in it and respect is due and the courage of that man must be remembered. Must be remembered. I've even seen um, some of the posts that Mr. Donald Campbell isn't important in this story anymore. So, um, respect and um, being reasonable, yeah, if, if that was the case, then we would have an agreement, that I'm sure. But for the Ruskin Museum, own the own Bluebird K7 in whatever entity it is, um, and if it has to come back in bits, what bits are coming back? You know, I mean, uh, Bill has already said that, well, you're not having that bit because, yes, we got it out of the lake, but we've now put a new bit on it, so therefore it's our bit. So it's an absolute minefield of taking it apart and trying to put it back together again. Yeah. Um, correct. But I, I think that's one thing we can all agree on, that it is a minefield. And we can continue in this minefield for as many years as we want yeah, to. Yeah, or we can, can I just, Of course you may. Can I just go in? <coughs> just some things that Bill said that don't really ring true with me, because I was on the Bluebird event working group, and we were never offered it in 2017, and we didn't force them up to Loch Fad. I've got an email from Malcolm Pitwood in 2016 saying, we'll arrange somewhere private to go. And my understanding is the original idea of Loch Fad was it was a private water so that any mistakes could be had not in the public gaze, then all of a sudden it ends up as what somebody described as Billy Smith's circus. Absolutely. And sorry, some of the things that, that Bill's come out with... They're not correct. Thank you. <laughs> and your comment about reasonable people? Absolutely. I've, I've been a volunteer for 35 years in a mountain rescue team. Yes. Why do I do that? I do that for the greater good, to help people yeah. and to make it so that you know, people can go and walk the fells with a degree, the degree of security. And I've been on, what, over a thousand incidents. Do I claim anything from no, that? I, no, I, I don't. I, I think from my perspective, we can continue this argument ad infinitum. And I think we can. Absolutely, we can. Yeah. Or we can decide that show. whatever's gone... You see, my, my whole issue with this is... Because a lot of it's been conducted behind closed doors without any independent arbiters, it's allowed each party to, as I see it, I might be wrong on this, but it's allowed each party to effectively take away their version of events and present their version of events to the wider public. And you've got a situation where the different groups in this are further apart than ever. I was at Lockfad as was Gina, and I was there to witness the first goings-on at Loch Fad in Gina's presence. And all I saw in Gina's presence on those few days we were there was basically a sense of wonderment at what had been achieved and a sense of only you could have done it and you're a bloody-minded, sometimes rather unpleasant person at times, Mr Smith, but you kind of had to be that to achieve what you've achieved. And but there's a time to switch. I, I, absolutely. I, I don't disagree. And as I've said from the start, I think a lot of things that have been said have totally undermined claims and people's positions. But where have you seen anything coming back from our side on social media? I, I, I've, I've seen plenty on social media. From who? From no one from this group of people. No, and we are the people. Fine, that, but yeah, no but one from, from this group of people. Of but but I've heard, I've seen <coughs> comments coming from the Ruskin Museum in terms of their press releases, but I think are unhelpful to what we're all trying to achieve. 
five more minutes. <laughs> and I suppose from my perspective, and I believe from perspective of many people who are, you know, passionate about this subject and passionate about this, is that we've got to find a way to work this out because Clive, Thank by you. all means. <laughs> I don't have an answer, but I heard some of what Bill said and I think we need to understand the position once again that I set out very simply. The only deed that applies in all of this at the moment is the deed of 2006. It hasn't gone away. It was very simple. Uh, the museum had to have the boat restored and put on display for the public good. That's all. That hasn't gone away at all. There have been debates. There have been talk about agreements. There are no other agreements. Now, the reason there are no other agreements is because any precursor requires the museum to give up part ownership of the boat. It can't do that. And that is the stumbling block. If that stumbling block is removed, then reasonable people can maybe go somewhere with this. That's it in simple terms. There's loads of emotion, lots been said, and there's lots of people who don't want to talk to each other and so forth, but it is actually that simple. Can I, can I just say that didn't Bill Smith's own lawyer draw up that original agreement yeah. and got the museum to pay for it? Yeah. So therefore, he was party to that agreement and knew what was going on, so therefore to say things well, have moved on. Don, that, that, that's right, but at yeah. the time... All the parties were working in harmony. Absolutely. They, were, they yeah. were looking forward. They weren't looking for reasons for, not, for this not to yeah. work. They put it down in very simple terms, and that's why I read it out. It is terribly simple, and that still applies. Now, if one party is saying, because we worked on this, we're entitled to ownership, we're not therefore going to move from that, that is the stumbling block. It doesn't matter what anybody else has said in the last 20 years. Unless that stumbling block is dealt with, this can't go anywhere in reasonable terms mm -hmm. because there needs to be that reasonableness to understand that you can't demand ownership from a body that can't give it. Again, I say it's simple. Uh, uh, so I can't where, make it any more simple. Where do we go from here? Well, we either have to pursue the dismantling uh, prospect and or the museum needs to sit and discuss what it might do. Bill might say, well, I will withdraw my demand to own part of this boat. And maybe he'll deliver it. I, I, I'm not expecting him to deliver it, but if he says, I will talk about this without demanding that I've got ownership, then there's something to be talked about. Which we agreed in 2019. On that table, around that table, we agreed that there wouldn't be an ownership. Once it was given to the museum, there was no ownership claim. But that seems to have gone under the... So, Indeed, and, and what we were told in that was from the museum's point of view was to put the entire wish list on that document and it would be negotiated from, from that point. And as soon as we put that document in, we were told, no, we're not, we're not accepting it and we're not interested in talking about it. Ownership isn't the thing that's on the table at the moment. Let's talk about the floor. Let's talk about radioactivity. Let's talk about almost anything but the elephant in the room, which is ownership. So, yep. Bill, can we hear from you finally? Yes, a um, couple of things I'd like to clear up. The um, regarding inviting um, the Bluebird Event Working Group, we had Robbie Robinson and Ron Rockland across in May of 2017, and we offered them the opportunity to put this together uh, to run it on Coniston, and, and that was how that was done. Um, but that's by the by. I'm not going to get into a, a he said, she said thing, but I've been called a liar, I've been called a thief, I've been called dishonest, I've been called, you name it. And it doesn't mean a thing, because that has, is, it's irrelevant. You know, I go home at night and I see my wife and my children, I'm happy in my own skin. I don't care if somebody wants to call me a thief or a liar. I'm not going to get upset about it. And the fact of the matter here is everybody has had to work at some point and probably still does with somebody they wouldn't get along with otherwise. And you can spend all day in the office doing your job professionally. You don't have to go to the house for a, a meal. You don't have to go out for a drink with them after work. You have to get on and do your job. And that's where we are now. And we could argue this till the cows come home. As I've said before, whatever problems are caused within the museum, um, with ownership, etc., 
that with the most greatest of respect is not Bluebird Project's problem because we have been assured all these years we would operate and maintain the boat. That's all we're looking for. We're quite happy to compromise. We're quite happy to negotiate and we're quite happy to work on a professional level and then turn around and go home when it's done. Simple as that. And that's what it needs. I mean, from, from your perspective, Clive, is that something that... Is that a seed well, to I, take I, this further? I'm sorry, I'll come back to the point I made just now. If the, if the precondition is, I'm only going to talk to you if we can have ownership, then it can't move forward. So if Bill Smith says, well, I withdraw that condition, then I can't see why people shouldn't be sitting around on a table within a month, weeks, days. But with that precondition, and I've explained that the trustees are not, they're reasonable men, but reasonable men within the confines of the Charities Act, and they have rules about display and regulations, and they, they can't do what they want. They, they're limited by, by their powers. They're, they're, uh, in some degree, they're, they're, they're officials, they're public people. They have to account for what they do. They can't simply make random decisions. They can't give the boat away. If Bill Smith were to say, OK, I withdraw that, then there's a conversation to be had, whatever it may be. I can't judge what that might be. Yes, a lot's happened, but if that condition is withdrawn, then the whole event takes on a completely different complexion. Do you want to it's comment? It's not a Bill? condition. It's not a condition. The fact of the matter is, we started with half of a boat, and we have acquired or created the other half of the boat, and we haven't given it away yet. It's not as though we've said, oh, we fancy half of that because we like the taste of it. We have added to what we were given to the extent that there was half and now there's an entirety. And we haven't given it away yet. Now, if the museum wants us to give it away, then they need to put something tasty on the table. But we thought we had that in hand. It seems we haven't. But there's still plenty of time to be professional about it. But we just haven't given away what is quite lawfully ours. Not to say, not to say it'll never happen, but we're not just going to serve it up on a platter with nothing in return. So, you know... You're caught, basically. So you're not willing to honour the deed of gift that your lawyers drew up and you were involved in drawing up because they discussed it with you? I asked Anne and Vicky whether they wished to have their lawyer draw it up or whether they wished to have me do it because they owed the Bluebird Project £1,200 and they chose to have our lawyers draw it up and pay for it with the money that they owed to us. So that's what happened there. Now, if you read the paper trail that I've supplied regarding the 2013 agreement, all those emails are in there. The fact it was drawn up by our lawyers because that was what was requested by Anne and Vicky. So I, I need to answer what something, uh, what Bill Smith has said there. Bill Smith is saying that, that anybody that gave anything to the project, to the rebuilding, whether it was in time, money, contributions, thought, whatever the, the addition was, uh, belongs to the project. Now, this hasn't been tested, and it may well be at some time, but I think if you were to ask the donor in the street that put in a fibre in the box or loaned an engine what they thought they were doing in making that donation, I think they would say, we were doing this to make the boat whole again, to put it back on the water, to get it in the museum, to make it work. Um, that's the real question. So Bill says he's not giving away what he's done. I don't think he understands that it's probably not his to give away because it wasn't donated to Bill Smith or the project, I don't think. And uh, again, I say this hasn't been tested, but I'm absolutely certain that the average person would say, I gave this to the blokes, whoever they were, rebuilding the boat on behalf of the museum to get the boat out there, and that's what we wanted to happen. So what he's saying is we're not... We, you have to give us something terrific because we're not giving away what we've earned. The project nor Bill Smith haven't earned that. They were never put in a position of working uh, to make the boat work and to therefore be placed in a position of ownership. They volunteered to do this job. I've been saying that since 2012, 2013. You so cannot it, and if we, it comes back again to the point that the condition of ownership being shared must be dealt with. And if I if I was to show you a paper trail that demonstrates how we produced and marketed our own DVDs and merchandise and issued purchase orders for tens of thousands of pounds worth of material in California to build sponsors, 
And I could also show you emails and letters from various stakeholders, including the engine donor, who has said quite categorically, we didn't give this to the Ruskin Museum, we gave it to you, and you are not to give it to them, and if it's not being run, give us it back. And that applies to a lot of the parts, because the sponsors and donors feel as passionately about this as everybody else. So that assertion is wider than Mark too. I've just got to correct you there, Bill. You're the one who's Correct. been saying that um, if it goes to the museum, it'll never run again. That you've been saying. I that. haven't said that. You it's have. Been widely you've said it on social media, and that is that is an untruth, and that misleads some of your partners or partners for the Bluebird Project. Misleads them into the into the belief that if it goes to the museum, it'll never see the light of day again. And of course, people are going to say, "Well, if it's never going to see the light of day again, you can't have it in the museum," and that. No, our partners are well. just as passionate as we are. That's the difference. No, it's they've, not. Seen, That's wrong. they've seen what's Very happened wrong. here, and they're, they're just as passionate as we are. Bill, I think that you've possibly been making promises to people who've been donating <gasps> that weren't necessarily your promise to make in terms of yeah. the deed of gift that says it should go on permanent display. Originally, the family was against it running, and you've gone ahead and told everybody that you can get parts, can, can you give parts, engines, whatever, to a boat that's going to be running regularly. Now, I don't believe that was your well, in, within I, your I, gift. I, I would say uh, well, I I'm going to have to. Promises. I'm going to have to break in there. <laughs> we time. we could be here all morning. Jeff, I, I think it would be useful just to ask because this is degenerated, just like I like we feared it would. <laughs> No, it hasn't. I, I, I think it's held up pretty car. well, actually, well, I think, con considering the but, Im emotion and... But, but, but ultimately, I think there's got to be a realisation that where we are now is going to lead to basically one of two routes. Yes. Either these people eventually, in an indeterminate period of time, get together and sort out their differences, or eventually, in that same indeterminate period of time, K7 will be dismantled, some parts will be delivered to Coniston, and then whatever arrangements the Ruston Museum have made to get K7 rebuilt, that will continue. What will happen in that period of time is that two or three or four years will elapse where we won't have a K7. We've got a chance of a K7 now, and it requires these people to start to speak to each other and continue speaking to each other until they've been able to form some basis of an agreement. And it is the responsibility of these people, and I'll happily put my hand up to help, but the responsibility of these people to start now communicating and speaking so we don't end up in a situation where we get a three or four year gap without a Bluebird K7 and without any guarantee that we'll have a Bluebird K7 at the end of that three or four year gap. Thank you, Neil. Uh, there's an awful lot there. Um, this was never intended to try and resolve the issues. Uh, it, it was there to air the issues. It was there to give people a, an opportunity to listen to the various um, points of view uh, in, in, in a public forum. You've seen for yourself, it's not easy. It's not an easy uh, solution. Uh, I think Neil is absolutely right. There probably are only two uh, routes out of this. And uh, it is for the people who are sitting around the table here to decide on which it is. I do apologize that there hasn't been the opportunity for uh, discussion and, and questions. We, we hope there would be. Uh, I'm sure there is the opportunity, we need to leave the room because there is another event happening. Uh, but the discussion and the conversation will continue. It's probably frustrating for some people that they haven't had the chance to air their own views. Um, but uh, I, I, I would like on behalf of uh, uh, Magneto and behalf of the RAC to thank the panel. Uh, it was pretty brave of you to, to come up and uh, be prepared to um, to talk about to talk about, about the issues, uh, I think at the end of the day we need to, within our minds, just consider the iconic uh, Donald Campbell, the amazing K7, and the fact that it really needs to be 
kind of uh, be seen up there, as we said before, with the Mallard, with um, Concorde, etc. Both in terms of engineering achievements, but also in sporting achievements as well. So uh, I think everybody agrees with that um, that it needs to be restored and it needs to be maintained for for the, for the public and for for Great Britain. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much for being an attentive audience. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you all probably may have may have a, be sitting on one side or the other of the uh, of the argument now, but uh, it'll be really interesting to hear your views afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.